the text today uh, it's it's found in Luke's sixth chapter if you're looking it up in your own version of God's word or you'll follow here a little bit well you know we live in a in a strange kind of a a time in many ways a difficult time as we've already been reminded and no one needs to be reminded of where we have fallen into this kind of a secular notion that that, that we are divided and that we should be divided and we find our own groups and our own groups are kind of right and our the other groups are wrong and whether they are imaginary or they are real or whether they are in person or they are just found on the web that you have found these groups and I belong here and and all my friends and you know I, I take what they say and even if they say the most incredulous things and you know I'll find a way of defending that and then here this other group people that I've never met but I know if they are not in my group, they must be wrong, and therefore, even the little thing they do, they must be wrong, and, and there's no way I can defend even the slightest thing that they might say is right. That is a kind of characteristic of our time, and it is part of the very kind of fabric of what secularism is what all about, and what, what anti-Christian kind of uh, Christian message is, is all about, and we need to kind of get beyond that and look at that and Jesus speaks to this and I hope we'll see not only how radical it is but how important it is there's so much going on and I want you to to see here when we begin with scripture things are different right in Christ there is no left or right in Christ, there it goes up and down, right? It starts with Scripture. Jesus came preaching, saying the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, therefore, and believe the gospel. Everything flows from that when we're Christians, yes? That's it. Anything and everything flows from that. And it's intriguing if you have chapter 6, verse 27, as we begin to read here, that you will notice something that, that Jesus speaks with such power. You know, he's not recommending. He is not suggesting. He is not encouraging. He's commanding. And he's not saying, this will be a good thing if those who love me will do these things. He's saying, this is what you do if you are my followers. It's pretty strong. Look here. Chapter 6, verse 27. And, and I say out front here, friends, that you need to know, and if you're listening from someplace else also, listen to this. Jesus is radical here. This is a part of, of the Sermon on the Mount, if you will. Probably the sermon he gave in different kind of context. In, in Matthew, it's clearly the Sermon on the Mount. And here's a different version. He's here speaking on a plane. It begins like this in verse 17. After coming down with them, he stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and with a great number of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. And they all came to hear him. And then he, it starts with, you know, like, like what we know, blessed are, the, blessed are uh, the poor because the kingdom of God is there. Blessed are the peacemakers uh, and so on. They will be called sons of God. And you get down to verse 27. I say to you, Jesus speaks, to you who listen, love your enemies, do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone uh, takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. To everyone who asks you, and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want for others to do to you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners, uh, should I translate that the way it was meant? Even the non-Christian love those who love them. 
If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even people who don't know Jesus do that. Or here, even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is gracious even to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's the text, friends. Straight from the lips of the one that we call our Lord. That is the one who is our master. That is the one from whom we take guidelines and commands. The Lord of life speaks to us about how we should organize our thoughts, if you will, and arrange our lives as it relates to our fellow human beings. You know, it's intriguing to me when you start, and it hit me. I've read this text a thousand times at least over the years, but it hit me in a new way as I was preparing for this, that it opens by this, to those who are listening. You know, as I, I mentioned earlier in the text that I read from verse 17, that this is not just for the inner circle, for those who are especially kind of dedicated, those who are uber-Christians, if you will. I really want to give my life to Christ, and everybody needs to know about it. There are people like that, but he, he's, he's talking to everybody, also those who are just kind of losing their Christian faith, maybe those who are not taking it quite so serious, but they still feel like they're listening to Jesus, those who are Christians in the broad sense of that term, he speaks to you. He, he is not just saying, this is for the very specially focused and those who love me, like, clearly, this is for you all, you who listen to me. And it made me ask this question, and I hope you will too, Am I really, really listening to Jesus? Or am I just kind of saying it? What does it mean, really? It's kind of a, a strange thing. You know, the lines are kind of drawn here, right? Uh, Jesus is, is not giving us a picture of some kind of utopian reality that is going to be truth in paradise. Once we get to the other side, all of this will be true. No, that's not what he's doing. Some have tried to interpret it that way, but that's clearly not what he's doing. No matter how great the temptation is for us to kind of relegate this to the hyper-idealistic kind of ideas that this would be good, we should strive for that. We know we never get there, therefore it's not really our responsibility. We certainly can't be held responsible for it when we don't reach that goal. That's not what Jesus is doing. You know, our forefathers, and some of you may not know that, but you know, in, uh, during Reformation, right, there was a radical Reformation going on also, and they were called the Anabaptists. They're our forefathers in the 1500s, right, and, and they were reading Scripture, and their big headline over their confession is Jesus Christ is Lord. Whatever he says is what matters, and because of that, they got into conflict with the state church and other things, and, and to kind of shut down their testimony, they, they took them down to the river in Zurich in Switzerland, and they, they tied big rocks on their feet and threw them in the river and drowned them. And the reason I mention that in relationship to this is because heart-wrenching, incredible stories about, about how their wives were walking next to them and their families, and they kept encouraging, don't recant, don't recant, you know, be faithful to Jesus, be faithful to Jesus, even as that happened. And I'm going, oh, wow. There's power in that kind of faithfulness to Jesus. You know, it is, I'm not trying to say that, 
that it is not pretty common, and, and we all fall into that, that this is, this is radical talk. It's difficult for us to actually live up to what Jesus says. But friends, he's not putting it up there as an ideal that is unreachable. He's putting it up there as this is what I want from those who follow me. Although it's hard, it does not mean, of course, that that kind of description of, of real radical love is not what should flow from the heart and from the lips and from the personalities of those who say, I am a follower of Jesus. I hope we hear this, friends. And, and, and we don't ever kind of mistake that for being better than someone else. It is simply an ethos that is different than the ethos that is in the world. That's why the church is called upon to be an alternative community, a community where everything looks different, love looks different, fellowship looks different, forgiveness looks different, you know, togetherness looks different where there's a different ethos. If you don't know what ethos mean in the ancient world, there were three things that mattered for someone who was speaking, right? Rhetoric, in other words, right? One is logos, which speaks to the rational argument. The other one was pathos, which speaks to kind of the heart engaging kind of emotional involvement in that. And the last is ethos, which was probably one of the most important thing. It has to do with the credibility of the one speaking. It had to do with, with someone who lived up and, and what he said and, and what was actually lived out corresponded. There was credibility, there was a character issue, and so he or she was worth listening to. And what Jesus is saying is that the ethos is changing among my followers. There's an ethos of the world that follows a certain set of guidelines and moral values, and there's an ethos among my followers that follows certain moral values and a different kind of guideline. So look back here, friends, and look at this here. More than anything else, what Jesus is saying is that there is a love that should dominate the Christian life. Even if Christians are hated, even if they are, if they are persecuted, even if they are, they are cursed, even they are mistreated, if they are beaten, if they're, they're, they're stolen and stripped of their rights, even as human beings because they're Christians. It happens so many places around the world. The answer is not to hit back, but to love back. And where do we get an example of that? Where do we see that model? Well, in no one less than God the Father himself. Look at verse 36. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That's it. We know what it means to be treated not as we deserve, but with love. Where someone is coming back to us, not with something they found in the drawer of revenge, but they pulled it from the drawer of love. You know, this is hard, and, and, and I know it, but it, it is just so important, not the least in, in this time that we live right now, right? And Jesus is illustrating this by saying, you know, here, here's what I mean, right? If someone is striking you on the one cheek, just turn the other. And I know there are a lot of people that think that's just idealistic nonsense. You know, nobody's going to do that. You know, we live in the 20th century, not in the 1st century. But friends, even that notion, that, that, that even saying that, just shows that it, that, that kind of response comes from the very attitude, the very ethos that Jesus is going up against here. He said, no, those who follow me, 
Something must change. It is a very task of love to transform enmity into friendship. That's where we see this. So let's go to the text and just look exactly at what the text actually says. Verse 27 goes with verses 20, uh, 32 and 33. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. If you only love those who love you, uh, what good is that? Even non-Christians do that. People who follow a different kind of ethos do that. If you only do good toward those who do good to you, everybody is doing that, even the non-Christians. In other words, you have lost your testimony. If you have nothing to give, nothing to say beyond what is just the most common thing. So Jesus says, if you are my follower, your response is different. And you know, it's even more incredible when you start looking at it. Because we start thinking, you know, our time is just different. Most of you think that way, right? I mean, we're 21st century. We're not first century. And if you're honest, you're thinking, well, back in your head, well, it's not quite as advanced back then. Uh Uh-huh. Just be honest. That was not so. Let me just say this. And I want to quote from you from some of the writers from that, right? In the first century, uh, the the great empire power was the Greco-Roman world, right? And and most people kind of held that worldview. Here's what one of the their great writers, right, an orator called Lysias was saying. He said, I consider it as an unquestionable truth that you should do everything you can to oppose your enemies and everything to serve your friends. And then if you go to the, to the first century Jewish population, uh, they were known to, to, to pray to God, to give them revenge, and, and that he would raise them up and just crush their enemies. And in, in the Qumran sect, whether one of the sects under, the, uh, under that, right, and if you don't know who they are, they're the ones, if you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were, they were the ones who developed the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so they said, hate those who don't follow the way of righteousness, as they had defined that. That's the background. Everybody knew that. And here comes Jesus. And he says, love your enemies. Do good toward those who mistreat you. Bless those who curse you. And he's not encouraging that. He's commanding that, and there's something even more that is hard to, I mean, it's hard to overlook when you look at the English text only, right? There are three words in Greek that can be translated love. One is phileo, kind of a brotherly warm love. He's not saying phileo, those who hate you. That is, have a warm kind of brotherly type feeling toward me. He's not saying that. He, he's not saying you need to develop kind of a warm, intimate, passionate kind of love for those who hate you. That would be eros. No, he's saying you need to be filled with a grace-filled, unselfish, totally committed love for them. Agape those who hate you. Agape your enemy. That's the very word that is chosen right here. I probably ought to just let you chew on that. I was thinking, what can I find of a contemporary or at least modern type examples of that? And there are many things probably that could be found as an example of that, I mean, some will find, point to Mother Teresa or maybe other things, but, but even right here in the U.S., when they bombed the house of MLK, there was a big group that came and wanted to find revenge and find ways of kind of really get after those who had done that. And MLK stood up 
And he said, we must love those who had done wrong against us. We may never let bitterness grow in our heart. We must meet hate with love. That comes from the lips of someone who has read Luke 6, 27, friends. It's not hard, but it's the kind of notion that Jesus is, is, is pointing to. Bum our homes, we'll respond in love. Threaten our kids, we'll respond in love. We will respond in love. Friends, I had to get on my knees several times on this because this is so radical. I had to ask myself, and I hope you will too, about yourself. How do I respond to those that you sense oppose you? Those that are just in the way. They're just irritating the living daylight out of you. Or those who actually kind of trying to put you down. How do you respond to that? Can you actually say, I heard Jesus when he says, love your enemies. It's kind of hard, isn't it? But nonetheless, it's the imperative that he gave And then it turns even more concrete, even more radical, if you will. Verse 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. We just thought it was hard when he said, love your enemies. Now this, you know, bless is, the word for bless is ologia in Greek, right? It, it logos means to speak about, and o means to good, to speak good about those who curse you, right? And the, the word for curse means that they, they speak evil upon you. How do you bless them? And, you know, I was thinking to myself, when is the last time that I have actually praised someone that irritated the living daylight out of me. With other people, someone that I thought, they're cursing me everywhere, but I speak them up. Even when I pray for them, I speak them up to God. I ologia them, I bless them, even if they do the opposite to me. How long has that been, friends? And Jesus says, If you have heard me speak, all those who are listening, that's how I want you to react. Will you do a test with me? Close your eye for half a second and think of someone you just can't stand their guts. Now utter a prayer of praise. I vow them to God. That's tough. That's tough to intercede for people like that. And then he's tightening it even more. If someone strikes you on the cheek, and he's not talking about slapping here, that word means hit. And the, the word that we translate as cheek really means jawbone. So he's, he's talking about someone hits you. And then he just says, what? Turn the other cheek? I mean, nobody's doing that. That's just foolish good, isn't it? Now he's not really talking about just being Dumb, foolish, good. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is that if you want to live with the ethos that comes from Jesus Christ, you need to meet whatever comes your way with love. 
You, you may be exposed to all kinds of things that are wrong, all kinds of things that, that are not true, but you need to be ready to respond with love. And that may be some of the hardest thing that you can ever do. Instead of spending your time, how can I get back at that person? How can I find a way of doing a revenge thing? The question is, how can I win this person? Love them to love Jesus, me, and fellow men. You know, the, the, the Jews at the time of Jesus had found out, you know, the rabbis and the scribes, that there were 613 laws that needed to be, that needed to be kept in the Old Testament. And because they had 613, that's the number, uh, they now begin to debate which one is most important. If you fu fulfill this, there might be something over here going on. So they had to now, they got into endless discussion about layering this, which was most important. And for Jesus, all of that is his complete, utter missing the point. It is not about how you can stretch God's regulations the most. It's not about how you can find a word that says exactly this or that. What it's about, Jesus says, that if you meet someone, always meet them with love. Love covers a multitude of sins. We know that, but love also wins people in the strongest way. Even if evil stares you in the eye, is what he's saying. Even if, if a hand of hate is slapping your cheek, meet that hand of hate with a peaceful gaze of love. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall become called sons of God. Now, this is the message from Jesus Christ, God's son. He is our example. He is our motivation. He is our model. And he shows his grace. Look at this here, right here. He is gracious even to the ungrateful and the evil. You know, I heard someone say it one time, maybe my dad, I forgot, he has a lot of those kind of sayings. But he was saying, God gives us friends to push us forward till we reach our potential. But God gives us enemies that we will be pushed way beyond our potential and see what God might be able to do in our lives. That's a strong word, friends. If you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, no one is turning the other cheek, that's an expression of, of weakness. Friend, God's love is always stronger than human hate always stronger than human opposition. It is always the greatest that shows grace to the weakest. That's why Jesus could say what he says. Be merciful just as you've seen your father be merciful toward you. Maybe I could say it this way. You know, love and mercy just gives peace to the exhausted. Love and mercy brings encouragement to the downtrodden. Love and mercy brings sunshine to the sorrow-filled. Think of that. God's hand is always reaching out to us with love. Yes? And don't put that 
in another box that doesn't touch the reality of how you reach out to others as God's ambassador. It's where we are, the best medicine ever for the ailments of this world is God's grace to us that is represented through us to those around us.